afternoon. I, I am really so excited to be a part of TEDx Rochester and to have this opportunity uh, to speak with you today. I'd like to tell you the story of how I backed into something that both horrifies me and angers me to this day. Something that I never expected, nor even dreamed that I would find. In the fall of 1990, I became the, the principal of a school that had some pretty severe challenges. Located in the city's poverty crescent, School 17 had a 98% poverty rating. Many children actually tried to get suspended. Many teachers had just given up hope and many members of the community had an adversarial relationship with the school. Graffiti covered the entire building, and clouded plexiglass and metal covered the windows. Inside and out, it was just like a war zone, a battle zone, and nothing at all like a sacred place for children and learning. Let's fast forward a few years. The school is bright and shiny and clean. The teachers have a missionary spirit. The parents and community, community have an authentic partnership with the school. And the New York State governor selects School 17 to sign significant legislation in our beautiful library. And he announces our school to be a New York State model school. Now, we made a lot of changes, and I can Thank you. Now, we made a lot of changes, and I can tell you just a few of them here. We started with changing the school culture. We simply put children first. We made every decision based on what is best for children not what is comfortable for adults. I stopped the busing to create a neighborhood school. We formed a huge and vibrant PTA. And we had many extensive school community partnerships. We changed the learning environment to make the school an island of safety and calm nurturance for children. The acid test for me when it came to instruction, was would I have my own child in your classroom? We demonstrated that we had one of the finest elementary school teaching staffs in New York State. Our mantra when it came to student success was no excuse. We built a Montessori preschool we had extensive before and after school tutoring programs, and we had intensive summer school programs. We literally extended the academic school day and almost had year-round school. But if the primary health needs of children in severe poverty are not being met, how can they learn? And many of the primary health needs of many of our children were not being met. So we built the first full-service community health center in New York State attached to a school. Then we doubled the size of this health center, and we built a full-service community dental center. All of this is open even when the school is closed. No one is turned away for any reason. In the 12 years that I was principal, we raised nearly $7 million, and we applied it directly to student achievement. I did everything that I was supposed to do, and so much more. We literally transformed the entire school community inside and out. But I have to confide in you. With all the changes that we made, we still had some very serious problems with a large core of our children when it came to learning and behavior. Many children 
who would skip anger and go directly to violent rage. Many children who would be taught a skill and forget it less than an hour later, their memory is severely compromised. And many of these children were coming from good and loving homes with parents deeply concerned as well. We had a model school. We had expert devoted teachers. We had engaged parent partners. We had superb facilities. We had an enriched environment for the student-centered culture. And we still had major problems with a large percentage of, our, uh, percentage of our children when it comes to learning and behavior. I didn't know what else to do. Believe me, I looked at this and analyzed this from every possible visible angle. What was missing? I asked myself constantly, what else do I have to do to level the playing field for my children? And then, strictly by accident, I overheard two nurses talking in our, he our health center about information that was contained on a child's individual and confidential medical record. And I asked them what they were talking about. And they told me, and I was stunned. And when I finally got access to all of my children's confidential and individual medical records, I read all of them. And what I found keeps me awake at night even now, if I think about it. I found the common denominator. Of my three, four, and five-year-old children, that were coming to school from the surrounding neighborhood. 41% of them had blood lead level histories that were over 10 micrograms per deciliter. The Centers for Disease Control say that that level and levels even lower than that cause permanent brain damage and loss of IQ. And that 41% does not include a huge cohort of children who had lead poisoning symptoms that did not have a history of blood lead testing. And even more compelling, when I looked into my large special ed population enrollment of the children who had histories of blood lead screening, 100% of them were lead poisoned. 100% of my special ed children. Now, let me tell you why this is so significant. Our bodies do not differentiate between, between lead and calcium. We process both the same, basically the same way. Calcium is important for an essential brain enzyme. Lead is a neurotoxin. Toddlers who are crawling and teething and have natural hand-to-mouth behaviors are especially vulnerable. Because developmentally, that's the time that their brain is experiencing explosive growth. And lead inhibits that growth. Let me show you a sample of the devastating effects, what lead, this neurotoxin, can do to cognitive behavior. This is what lead can do to children. Hyperactivity and difficulty focusing aggressive and impulsive behavior, rigid, inflexible problem-solving abilities, problems with social interaction, loss of working and functional memory, and learning problems in school with reading, language, math, and writing. And, and let, let me pause just here for a moment, and let me talk about reading. We all know that when it comes to learning how to read, an important step in that process is learning the letter sound relationships, phonics. Lead can interfere with a child's hearing, but not so much to make that child hard of hearing. What lead does is interfere with auditory processing. In other words, lead can interfere 
and create auditory processing delays or distortions so that the child is not accurately hearing the letter-sound relationships and consequently is having great difficulty in learning how to read in grade one and two. Now, I find that really insidious. And this list does not even begin to name the physical and other cognitive deficits that this neurotoxin can do. There is no safe threshold for lead in a, in a developing child's body. National childhood uh, poisoning expert and researcher, Dr. Kim Dietrich, once handed me a little glass tube of vial. He told me that there was enough lead in this container to poison a two-year-old child well over 10 micrograms per deciliter. I looked at it, I shook it, I held it up to the light, I stared at it, and finally I said, Dr. Dietrich, I don't see anything in here. And he said, that's just the point. The microparticles are clinging to the inside of the glass. That's how potent this neurotoxin is. It is not children sitting and eating handfuls of lead paint chips. And it is not just deteriorated housing in the urban areas. Remodeling projects that are done without lead safe work practices or houses that were built before 1978 can cause a serious risk. So, when I discovered that almost half of my children were coming to school with permanent brain damage from lead poisoning, I was horrified and I was outraged. And as principal, I called a huge press conference to report what was happening to my children. And at that press conference, I called childhood lead poisoning the silent and invisible monster that is devouring our children right before our very eyes. This monster is devouring our children's IQ. If you take someone's IQ, you have stolen their future. But this monster is not just satisfied with children. It affects every single one of us in our society in a negative way. We all pay for this lead po poisoning monster one way or the other. So right after this press conference, I became one of the founding members of the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning. Now in Rochester, our community has done a real good job in putting a face to this invisible monster through education. And we have evolved and surpassed many other communities in New York State and across the nation. And that is why the EPA has recently awarded the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning with the Environmental Justice Achievement Award and has named Rochester a national model for the primary prevention of lead poisoning. Thank you, but I must say that for all the courage that this community has shown, the most difficult work is yet to come. Please let me explain. In Monroe County, we do a good job in finding and locating one-year-old children and testing them, but we are only finding and testing half of the children, two-year-old children, half of the two-year-old children in Monroe County. And we know that's the age where much of the dam brain damage can occur. And when it comes to urban children, often the most vulnerable are the ones that are the most difficult and the hardest to reach and to test. And it's often those very children that we read about so tragically and almost daily in our newspapers.
you know, I have many memories throughout the tenure of my principalship that bring me great joy. But I am haunted by the faces and the memories of the children that we just could not reach. And I will tell you the story of a mother that represents so many of these haunting memories for me. She was a good mother, a responsible mother from a good family. I knew the family well, but she was sitting in my office that morning and she was weeping. She was weeping silently and she was breaking my heart. And I knew why she was in anguish. They were taking her nine-year-old son from her that day to be institutionalized. He was hurting small animals and many other children, and he was just so violent that she could no longer control him. And we could no longer control him in the public school setting, even with that wonderful staff. So I pulled a chair up and I sat down beside her. And I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. I just reached out and I held her hand. And after a few minutes, she caught her breath and she turned to me. And I will never forget ever what she said to me. She said, oh, Mr. Spezio, he was my brightest child. And on a hot summer day, I would move his crib over to the window so he could catch a cool breeze and listen to the children playing in the yard and watch the squirrel in the tree next to the house. And I'm here to tell you that that little boy had his brain fried on that windowsill from those microparticles of lead there. And I remember thinking to myself at the very moment she said those words to me, this should not be happening. This is totally preventable. That little boy needed to be protected. He should have been protected. We can reach, not most, but all of the children in Monroe County by continuing our tenacious advocacy for the primary prevention of lead poisoning. And we can do that in the following three important ways. We must continue our education to all segments in our society. You cannot protect your child from a danger you don't know about. We must continue our, to our, improve our policies and monitor those policies for effectiveness. And we must establish a state housing endowment, just like 40 other states have done, that provide no interest and low interest funds for the rehab of our state's housing stock so that we can make houses lead safe and to make healthy homes for children and families for generations to come. I believe that a civilized society is measured by how well that society protects its children. That's what I believe. And if the adults in the society don't protect the children, who will? We have done an amazing job in that regard in our community. But we must continue, and we must not stop until every single one of our children is protected and this invisible, insidious monster is slain once and for all. And it's only then 
that we will all truly know that we have really put children first. We have put children first. Thank you.